the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. This is a very special uh, message for me to, to bring to you. Um, to be back in this pulpit is a great privilege for me. Uh, it was uh, September 11th that I last stood here and I preached a message called Fighting the Good Fight because at that time I was going through one of the greatest fights in my life and it was uh, for my health. September 11th, I brought that message here. September 12th, we launched a program in our ministry called Vision 2020 to bring 20,000 training schools into the nations of the earth and to the poor. And on September 13th, I went into urgent care and was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And um, that began a journey that is ending where I am here tonight. Um, From those seven days in hospital and them stabilizing my heart, they discovered a valve that had been faulty since I was a teenager. And three weeks, uh, sorry, uh, 12 weeks ago, three months, as of Monday, Um, I had to have open heart surgery and uh, had to go through the process of of recovery and go through the process of, um, you know, waking up with tubes through my body and and more needles and things in my arms than than a drug addict and, uh, you know, just going through the process of what it is to go through open heart surgery. It was not uh, an easy process and, you know, through it all, Um, there's been tremendous lessons that God has downloaded in my heart because such are the realities of life. And there are are many times that one faces situations in one's life where one has a thousand questions. How many of you have a few questions when you reach uh, heaven to ask the Lord about? Just uh, a few things that don't make much sense when you're in them and when you're going through them. And God had began to prepare my heart for what I went through and what I've been going through he began a number of months earlier to, to, uh, to prepare me when I was reading through the end of Judges. The book of Judges is a, is a very uh, interesting book. It's a very profound book. But at the end of Judges, there in the Judges chapter 20, and we're not going to look at it in detail. I'm just going to give you a b- very brief summary because it's not the core of my message. But there's a story there of a rape that happens in Israel. And the children of Israel get mobilized and they decide to deal with the citizens of Gibeah who were responsible because it was a gang rape. And they, want, they went to the city and said, turn over these people, we want to bring them to justice. Well, the people of Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin somehow decided that they were going to refuse to do that, that they would rather fight the whole nation of Israel than do justice and bring those people to justice. And so the whole nation of Israel gathers together to fight Benjamin, and they come before the Lord. And I mean, this is not an ungodly fight. They are fighting for a, for a, a just cause. They are fighting for something that should be done. And um, they go to the Lord and they say, "God, you know, you know, should we go up? And and who should go first? And God says, "Go up." And He says, "Send Judah first." I mean, we often hear about the, the praise is going first, and Judah means praise. And so the children of Israel, at the obedience to God send Judah up to fight against Benjamin. Well, the next day when they go up for this fight, they immediately lose 22,000 people get killed from the children of Israel. And Benjamin routs them. And I'm looking at that scripture, I'm saying, Lord, you told them to go up. You even told them who to send first. And now 22,000 people are dead. Well, they gather again and they ask God again. And God says, Go up again. So they go up the second day, and 18,000 people die. And now they gather the third time, and they cry out to the Lord, and they, 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 they bring, I think Phineas comes in, and they, they, they cry out to God. They say, God, we're just trying to do what's right. We asked your help, and, you know, do we even go up a third time? And God says, go up for this time. I'll deliver them in your hands. And the third time, they ambush, they sit in ambush, and they rob Benjamin, and they bring justice, and they win the battle. But it's a very strange story, because, you know, they asked God, God told them what to do, and then they had two, they lost 40,000 people. 
That was, the, that was the thing that jumped off of the page for me. I then turned over the page and went to the book of Ruth and read the story of how, um, you know, Naomi and, and her husband go down to um, Moab and they, 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 you know, they go and visit. They go, actually, there was a famine in Israel. They went down to Moab and Elimelech is the husband. The two sons of, of, uh, of Naomi and Elimelech, they marry wives. And there in a space of 10 years, the husband dies, Elimelech dies. Then next, Ruth's husband dies. And then the sister's husband dies. So Naomi is left. Here's a godly woman. And she's serving the Lord. She loves God. And her and Ruth are left in the land of Moab. Now, if an initial reading of that story, you would just think, you know, God, what are you doing? And maybe these people were living in sin, and maybe things were just going wrong. But there are many times in life when there are no easy answers, when there's more questions than answers, when, you know, if you were to judge that story from the first chapter, you would think that God's not around. And many, many times we see things in a momentary fashion, but there's much more to the story. And this, this began to open up a, a message in my heart, what happens when bad things happen? And the title of this message is When Bad Things Happen. How do you deal with them? How do you go through them? How do you navigate them? Now the same pattern not only happens on the negative side and say, well, God, when something bad happens, but how many of you have questions when you see somebody who's totally wicked, some dictator, or even just a neighbor, maybe who's a drug dealer, who drives the best car, who's got all the stuff in the world. You see people who are very either wealthy, they're good looking, they have great, but they don't serve God at all. They don't give them any credit. They don't, they, they, some of them are atheist, anti-God. And yet they seem to be amazingly blessed. And so God began to take me to Psalm 73, and this is where we'll begin to pick it up on the, on the overheads. Looking at this question, what, what do you, how do you react when bad things happen in life? We're going to read it from the New Living Translation, so you may want to just listen to it, because it may not match your Bible, but I think this version is amazing in the way it brings out the truth of the Scripture. And you can read it on the overhead. The psalmist is writing in Psalm 73, he says in verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. He says, But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. And this guy's pretty much saying, I almost lost my faith. Because sometimes when things happen in life, you almost lose your faith, because you're just wondering where God is. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He says, I almost was almost gone. My feet were slipping. He said, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and they clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything in their hearts could ever wish for. I like that. These fat cats. In verse 12, if we pick it up there, he goes on and he says, Look at these wicked people. They're enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Anybody ever can identify with that? So I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. He's speaking to God. And then in verse 16, we'll move over to the New King James Version because it says it to me in a more stronger way. He says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Isn't that a profound statement? He says, when I, when, I, when, I, when I try to understand this, he said it was just too painful for me. Because he knows that God's a just God and God's a good God, but he just can't reconcile what he's seeing in the lives of others with what he is going through. And then he says these words, 
until. Everybody say until. until. It'll be too painful you, for you to understand until I went into the sanctuary of God. He says, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. You know what? There's so many things that we won't understand until we understand the end. Until we understand the end. And so my first point, if we want to, you know, understand things when bad things happen, we must focus on the end. We must keep our focus on the end. Because only when you understand the end will you see it in right perspective. Only when you understand the end of the story of Ruth do you realize that out of this came Boaz and that Ruth and Naomi went back to Israel and Boaz married Ruth. And from that line and genealogy came the great-grandparents of King David, of Jesse and then David. And that from David came the line of Solomon and came the, the kings and came the promise and came down to Jesus. The end of Ruth is Jesus. Amen? Amen? And sometimes we see things only in a moment, but God wants us to look at the end. I want to give you just a few helpers in this process as you look at things you don't understand. But let me just say this in concerning the end. You know, sometimes I, I love, I'd love to use the TiVo machine on, on, my, on my, you know, watching television. And especially it's a football game, you know, you TiVo the whole thing and, and uh, then you don't have to watch all the commercials. You know, you can come back and just fast forward through. But I, I don't like it when I've TiVo'd a game and then I go up to somebody and say, oh, did you know, you know, the Giants beat the Packers this weekend? And I'm like, now you just ruined the game for me. Because now I know the end. So the only reason I watch the game now is to find out how the Giants beat the Packers. <laughs> not whether they beat the Packers. It kind of ruins the game because, you know, if you know the end, it's not a question of how it turns out. It's a question of how it turns out. It's not a question of, you know, the details. It's just a question of how it actually transpired and happened. There was a story of Winston Churchill in the Second World War. And Winston Churchill, they, they were fighting Hitler. And it was a, you know, it was a very, very dark hour of the war. The United States was not yet in the war. And Winston Churchill was, was fighting the Battle of Britain. And uh, Hitler was taking over the nations of Poland and France. And, and it was just, just storming across Europe. And right after that, Pearl Harbor happened. And when the Pearl Harbor happened, the United States made the decision to enter the war. And there's a story that happened that Winston Churchill, when he heard the news that the United States had joined the war, that he went to his liquor cabinet and he took out his finest cognac and he poured himself a rather generous glass and to all of those who were with him. And he toasted the end of the war. And they say, what are we, we, we haven't won the war yet. He says, it's only a matter of time now that the United States has joined the fight. You see, we know how it ends. We know how it ends. It's just a matter of time before we win the fight. And we will win the war because Jesus has already won the victory. Amen? But these are some things that you can remember as you're facing battles. And I'm going to throw up a few scriptures just to help you. You can just write down the verses and you can look them up later, but they'll come up on the screen as well. When you go through something you don't understand, you have to remember that man's ways are not God's ways. 
And just because we think God should do something this way does not mean that he has to do it that way. And the Bible says these words in Isaiah 55, God says these words to man. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So remember, God's ways are not our ways, even though we want them to be. Number two, you have to remember that God is weaving history. See, we just look at something that happens from, you know, the front page of the newspaper or just something that happens in our personal lives. But God is looking at a much bigger picture than you and I. He's looking at generational things. He's looking at the whole of history. And if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus, when he was going to the cross, nobody understood anything. His disciples were like, no, Jesus, nobody's going to arrest you. You're not going to die on the cross. You're not going to go. You're not going to suffer. You're not going to. I mean, they were, Jesus had to rebuke them because Jesus knew what he had to go through. Are you with me? This is what Jesus actually says when they are, 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 are asking him these questions. And he says these in Luke 22, verse 37. He says, For I say to you that, that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He's speaking about him being arrested and being a part of this group that was, um, you know, that was being put to death on the cross. And then he says, for the things concerning me have an end. That's a very interesting statement that he adds in there. He says, I've got to fulfill scripture, but don't worry, there's going to be an end. The things concerning me have an end. The things concerning you have an end. The last chapter has not been written in your life or your story or your situation. The things concerning you have an end. And sometimes you're just fulfilling what has to, you have to go through. I had to go through open heart surgery. I had a valve problem since I was a, a teenager. It was mended by God's grace by a marvelous surgeon, Dr. Razuk, here at Loma Linda. And by God's grace that he did an amazing job of, of performing that surgery. And through it all, I was able to lose 40 pounds. And through it all, my heart is stronger and better and, and more true today than it was maybe 10 years ago. Because... The things concerning my life have an end. And if you had judged my life three months ago, you wouldn't have thought so. I thank God for all of those of you who prayed. And thank you for all of those who stood in the gap through that time. Because I know that it was the prayers of God's saints that did so much of the work. So these are the first two things. God's ways are not our ways. And the second thing, God is weaving history. The third thing is that we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is, you know, is degrading. Everything around us, you buy a car and it just deteriorates. You buy a house and it deteriorates. Those of you who are over 50, you have a body that deteriorates. And just about everything in life, there's, this, there's even a law of thermodynamics, a second law of thermodynamics, which just talks about everything goes from order to disorder. And we're in a world that's a fallen world. It, it, it moves towards, you know, uh, every kind of uh, wrong that there can be. It's always trying to pull people down. It pulls people towards fear, towards failure. It pulls people down this whole world. Even gravity pulls us down. We have to realize we live in a fallen world. And so part of what we face in this world is because of the of the sin of Adam and because of the, the fallen state of our world that we through Christ have to work to renew and that we have to fight against that fallen world to bring the renewal of Christ and the life of God to bear. Number four, there's a huge spiritual battle going on. Don't ever underestimate the power of the devil. There is a real devil, there is real evil, and there are real demons. And we are in a spiritual battle. 
for our families, for our finances, for our future, for our health, for our strength, for every part of our lives, you have to realize there is a spiritual battle going on. And this last area I want to touch on is the area of death. Because so many people are tripped up and that have a tremendous trouble getting over the loss of a loved one. And what God began to show me is that the way He looks at the loss of a loved one is often very different to the way we look. Especially if the person knows Him and the person is saved. When, when a person is lost here, it's heaven's gain. God can't wait to have them home. The Bible actually says these words, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of His saints. Jesus said to His disciples, He said, it's good that I go. They said, no way, no, Jesus, it can't be good that you go. Jesus said, if I go, the Holy Spirit will be sent. And so God sees death differently. And many of you have heard um, Cheryl Salem when she ministered here, how she lost a five-year-old to a brain tumor. And we do have a DVD back there of her story. But what was the most profound thing in that entire teaching that she gives and how God caught her up into the heavens and she had a face-to-face -face encounter with Christ and her heart was devastated over the loss of her little child and she was in depression and she wanted to die. She wanted to just say, God, take me home. I want to be with my daughter. And she was so pining over the loss of her child, her five-year-old, to a brain tumor. And the words that Jesus spoke to her when she was questioning God up in heaven, this was when she was in an operation. She was about to go in for an operation and she had this experience. And the words Jesus said was, Gabriella, your daughter, is not in your past. She's in your future. The person you love is not in your past. They're in your future. They are ahead of you. They're waiting for you. And so the way that God looks at things is different to the way we look at things. And so we have to get a divine perspective of everything in our world. And that scripture, Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. God says it's precious to Him when a person goes home to be with Him. And then Romans 8, 28, we must learn the scripture. And this is one that, will, that you can hold on to in the middle of every crisis. And we know that all things, everybody say all things. all things. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And whenever you go through things, you just know that God is going to work it all together for your good because you love God and you're called according to His purpose and He will work it to your good. And sometimes in the, in the moment you can't see it, but God will do it. So all of that falls under us focusing on the end and understanding these principles are in play, understanding that they're all part of the picture, that it's a very complex picture, but realizing that there's more at work in this whole situation than just your personal feelings and what you're going through. There's a much bigger picture going on. And seeing that and understanding that will help you to navigate when bad things happen. But part two is we must learn endurance. We must learn endurance. And this word keeps coming up in the scriptures with very close ties to the subject of focusing on the end. You're going to see this again and again. We'll look at a few scriptures here. Who knows the story of Job? One of the most, you know, just... Difficult to understand stories in the entire Bible of a man who's righteous before God, who's living a good life, who's got tremendous wealth, who's doing great, who serves God, loves God, fears God, and then this battle happens between the devil and God, and Job loses everything. Loses his kids, loses his family, loses everyone except his wife. And then he loses his health, loses his possessions, loses everything. And then this tremendously difficult book. But at the very end, and the book of James talks about the story of Job. In the end, God restores everything. 
In fact, He not only restores everything, He restores it many fold over. And He has more wealth than He ever had before, and He has more children, and He has see, lives to see His great, great, great grandchildren. And James talks about this, and he refers to Job in James chapter 5, verse 11. He makes this statement about Job. He says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Let's say that word. Let's, we count them blessed who? Endure. endure. And then he says, You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end. Everybody say end. end. We count them blessed who endure. And we've seen the perseverance of Job and seen the end. Intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Isn't that a profound, profound understanding? We count them blessed to endure. And enduring to the end is so critical. Jesus says in Mark 13, verse 13, He makes a statement about the end times and about Christians and what we're going to have to face and go through. Or Christians are going through in persecuted countries even right now while we're here tonight. We work in many of those countries. And Jesus says this about the end times, about us as Christians. And he says, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. You have to endure to the end. And sometimes it is an endurance race. And sometimes it's not easy. And sometimes it's a tough battle. But those who endure to the end will be rewarded. They will be saved. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The writer of Hebrews writes these words. and He says, Therefore we also... Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he's talking about all the saints that are watching us as we run our race and as we finish our race here on earth. He said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. What does it mean to endure? What does it mean? Let me tell you what it means to endure. You keep on loving and you keep on forgiving even when people do you wrong and even when people are hating you endure by keeping on doing what's right you endure by keeping on loving and you keep on forgiving even when everybody else is doing the opposite to endure means that you continue in obedience and faithfulness even when other people are persecuting you and you continue to just serve God and obey Him and be faithful to Him and be faithful to His Word. Endurance means that you don't stop doing what you know is right to do. You continue tithing and giving even when things go rocky in your, in your resources, when things are, 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 are up or whenever they're down. You know what? You endure by saying, God, you're in control of my finances. You're in control of my life. You're in control of everything that I have. Nothing that I have does not come from you. And I'm going to continue to do what I know is right. I will bring my tithe into your storehouse. I will bring the offerings of God. We began about a year and a half ago to give abundantly to the Miracle Birthday Offering. It was a difficult decision and we took what we gave as our tithe and offering and I just went ahead and I added a percentage and I decided I'm going to give to that. Do you know that we've had more blessings from the day that we started doing that than anything else we've ever done in terms of our finances? Because God is able to make all grace abound to you. And you endure by continuing no matter what you go through, you say, God, I'm going to continue to tithe and give. You continue to study and learn God's Word, and you continue to put God's Word first. Everything in your life, you put God's Word first. You continue praying and believing. You continue praying and believing. You know, prayer is a difficult thing to many people to understand. And I don't understand either, because I've seen 
people pray for somebody that to me did not deserve to get healed and instantly they're healed and another person prayed and they did, you know, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, anybody deserves a healing, it's this person and they didn't get healed. But probably one of the greatest lessons I ever learned in prayer, I was Reinhard Bonker's television producer over in, in Germany and we traveled all over the world with, during crusades with his ministry and my wife Lisa and I were in the Philippines my wife was pregnant at the time, and, and I remember filming this crusade. It was a, uh, a nine-day crusade in Metro Manila. It was in the, in, in the downtown area of, of Manila, the Philippines. And on the second day of the crusade, I, I decided to just, because I was filming and trying to document the event, I filmed the intercessors. And there were hundreds of intercessors praying before the crusade. And they were crying out to God for the salvation of people. And as I was filming, suddenly a, a young boy, about maybe six or seven, maybe eight years old, just caught my attention. There was all adults, but one child. And a young child. And so I filmed that child and I... I just, and he was crying out. He had the other woman's hands by, in both hands, and, and he was just caught up with God, crying out to God. And I thought, you know, what an amazing sight that this, this young child is praying. Well, the third day went by, the fourth day. On the eighth day of this crusade, I was filming on the platform, and Reinhardt prayed for the sick, and suddenly two young kids came forward. And the one was weeping and crying. And he had his friend with him. And it was probably a, maybe a, a, a five or six year old child that was with him. Much shorter than him. And he had his arm around him and, and he said, my friend can hear. He'd been deaf and dumb since birth. And Reinhardt tested this little child and, and he could hear you know, sounds 25 feet behind him. And the crowd went crazy. And as soon as this little boy realized his friend was healed, I mean, tears were streaming. I have this on video, just streaming down the child's face. And he grabbed his friend and hugged him and just, and Lisa took them off and put their testimony and wrote it down. And, I, and it was one of the most touching miracles that I ever witnessed in my time with Reinhardt. And I got back to the editing room back in Germany and I was, you know, I was editing the story. And I looked at the this child on the eighth day and suddenly I recognized the t-shirt and I said you know what I've seen that shirt before and I went back to my tapes from you know the second day and that child was the one praying with the intercessor on day two and I'm thinking God why didn't you heal him on day two how about day three how about day four how about day five how about day six why did you have to wait to day eight but there's something about persistent prayer. There's somebody who endures in prayer. Somebody who doesn't give up and doesn't stop praying for their kids and doesn't stop praying for their, their family and stop praying for their business and stop praying for their home. We cannot stop. We must endure in prayer. Amen? And that child was completely healed. The last point is that we must remember that there's a reward. There's a reward. If we will continue, if we will not give up, if we will endure, there's an end. And the end is good. The end is good because the, the end intended by God is always good. The end intended by God for you is full of compassion and it's full of mercy. And the end is good. It's always good. We have, as we go back to Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews says these words. He says, For you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You see, You've got to realize that you're not just doing it just so that you can do it. You don't just endure and you don't just keep your faith and you don't just keep going, oh, well, God, there's nothing better to do. You do it because there is a reward. There is a promise to you. 
There is something good at the end of this rainbow. And we will get to the end of the rainbow and we will find the pot of gold and it will be ours and we will enjoy it in Jesus' name. Amen? He says you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, after you've endured, after you've continued to do the will of God, continue to do those things which you know are right, no matter if everybody's hating you, you're still loving. And all these areas that the enemy tries to say, well, stop doing that. You, well, God's not really there. And he throws the, you know, the kitchen sink at you. You just say, I will continue to do the will of God. I will continue to do what's right. Because we have need of endurance. After we've done the will of God, we may receive a promise. And the promise is good. James 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Again, the word endures. For when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You may have to go through a season of temptation. You may have to go through a season of trial. You may have to go through a season of conflict or of trouble. But if you will endure it, there'll be a crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amen? Again, that scripture that we read in Mark. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Your very salvation is based on your enduring to the end. That's a reward. Your eternal salvation is based on enduring. And, and the scripture that we read earlier in Hebrews about the great cloud of witnesses, if we go to the very next verse in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, we, we picked it up from before. Let us run with endurance the race that was set before us. And then he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you realize that Jesus endured the cross and he despised the shame, hanging naked before the whole earth? He despised the shame. Because he had one reason that the Bible gives here. For the joy that was set before him. There was a reward before him. His reward was you and I coming to this altar and giving our lives to Jesus. The reward of Jesus was our salvation. It was the joy that was set before him that enabled him to endure the cross. He wouldn't have made it otherwise unless he had seen your face on the other side. And seeing you, that he saw you having eternal life with him. And the Bible says he despised the shame. And he endured the cross and he went through the suffering. For one reason. It says, for the joy that was set before him. And now he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he can watch you come into his kingdom. One final scripture. You know, when you look at the Olympic athletes, people say, oh, why are you working so hard? People, these athletes, I mean, they, 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 from when they're small children, they, they are in this regimen of training. They're in this incredible, difficult season of, you know, of becoming the best in the world. And I've watched, you know, documentaries about these, these Olympic athletes, and what they go through is unbelievable. I mean, you look at the ones in China. I mean, they don't even have a life. They're actually put in these cities and these places and they live and breathe whatever sport they're, they're, they're preparing for. And what's so amazing about them is you, you know, if you went to an Olympic athlete, you say, why are you putting yourself through this? Why are you, you know, struggling so much? Why do you have this discipline regimen in your life? And why are you eat, watching your food and everything in your entire life? And they'll say one thing to you. I want a gold medal. They're after a prize. You have to realize that there is a lot of incentive in a prize. We will do a lot of things for a prize. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain this prize or obtain it 
And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. You've got to realize that there is such a reward ahead for you. There is such a prize for enduring. There is such amazing eternal treasures that God has promised. The promises of God to a believer who endures to the end are endless. They are eternal. They are beyond your imagination. They are enormous. And they are great. They are worth the price. And they are worth the price that we must, we must pay now. We're tempered in our, in our lifestyle. We're tempered in what we do. We watch what we do. We watch how we do things. We want to live a life that's pleasing to God. We want to endure the temptations. And we want to endure the trials. Because there's, a, there's an end. The last chapter has not been written. And it's, when it's written, it's going to be good. And your story is going to read as a testimony to the goodness of God. No matter if you feel like Job right now, we've heard the end intended by the Lord, that God is very merciful and God is very good and God has is is got a great ending for your story in Jesus' name. Amen? I want to close with a story from my junior school in Africa. I grew up in South Africa. And I went to a boarding school when I was seven years old. And once a year we had the sports, the athletic sports uh, event. It was, it was, it was a, a day of competition in the school. And it was always, you know, all the different houses that were different colors and they, diff they competed. And I always remember there being one race. And I say this to say... It's not how you have started, but it's how you finish that's going to determine your prize. And you may not have done that great up until now, but don't worry about the past because it's what you do from now to the end that's going to make the difference. Amen? In the race that was the, what we called the 440, it was 440 yards and it was four times around the track. And it was the longest race because we were just small kids back then. And I remember the kids started off on the, on the starting line and, and they fired the gun and they, they all went off. And everybody sprinted up ahead and they were going like crazy around the track except for one guy. His name was Fat Mac. I won't give his full name because he may even hear this message one day. I just called him Rodney. And Rodney started off with a trudge. And literally, he trudged around that, that, that track. By the time he got to the end of the second uh, lap, they, the guys in the front had lapped him. And by the time he finished the third track, Everybody else in the entire field had finished the race. But the entire crowd that had gathered for the day had to watch Rodney do his final lap. And I mean, people were looking at their watches and people were like, oh my goodness, when's this guy going to finish this race? Is this guy going to finish the race? Rodney was considerably overweight at that time in his life. But he just trundled and he just trudged. And we all watched him as, and he did this every year that I remember. This wasn't a one-time, one-time thing that he did. Coming to about a hundred yards from the close of the race, Rodney moved into a sprint. And I remember his face just going glowing red. And he went into the fastest that that kid's feet could take him. And he came around that final corner. And I mean, he was roaring. I mean, he was running to that finish line. And the entire crowd rose to their feet. And they gave that kid a standing ovation. 
And he always finished well. He got more applause than the kid who came first. Every year, Rodney knew how to finish well. You may have been trudging up until now, but God wants you to finish well. You may be coming around that final, that final uh, corner. You know, just this is so much from my heart. I'm so blessed and privileged to be able to stand here again since September 11th to the present to again be able to preach the Word of God to you. I, I'm sharing something that's so close to my heart, so deep in my heart, because God has taken me through something. I'm not just preaching to you something that just, you know, I just went and did a Bible study on. I'm telling you that these principles work. You must focus on the end. You cannot take your eyes off the end. Do not judge something before it's time. Remember that there are other things in play. You must learn endurance. And you must remember there's a reward. If God spoke to you tonight, just give the Lord a hand. Amen. Before we close, I want to make sure that everybody is okay with God and that every one of you, you know, if, if you were through any tragedy to have this as your last day on the planet, and you may say, oh, well, you know, I've got lots of time to make a decision for God. And there are people here tonight, maybe you were bought by a friend, that your life's not right before God. And if you were to die right now, you wouldn't make heaven. And tragically, there are lives that, that, you know, can get in a car accident any single day. I mean, things can happen in, in life. And it's so important. The Bible says, don't wait till tomorrow. The Bible says, today is the day that you need to make a decision for God. It's not something that you can ever put off. And so the question that I, I want to ask to all of you tonight is that if this was your last day on the planet... If you were on your way home and something tragically happened and for some reason you died and you now cross the threshold of death and you're on the other side and remember there's no second chances when it comes to death and you're on the other side and the question is would you open up your eyes in heaven or would you open up your eyes in hell? And it's a profound question. It's not for you to answer publicly, but it's a question in your heart. And many people may say, well, I, I hope I would, or I think I would. And the trouble is that there's nowhere in the Scriptures, as the Bible say, that you can think just because you think you're going to make heaven that you'll make it or that you hope. So a lot of people hope they'll make heaven and they've opened up their eyes in hell. I want to know where I'm going to open up my eyes. I want to know for sure. And so we have to look at what the Bible says about this topic. Some people say, well, you know, I'm a good person. I've done more good things than bad. I'm sure God's going to put on a scale. And I'm pretty sure my scale on the good side is going to be better than the bad. The Bible says it only takes one sin to put you in hell. That's why Jesus had to die. Jesus actually had to pay the price that you would have had to pay for your sins. He had to actually go to hell for you. He had to die for you. Because just one sin is enough to put you in hell. And so, just because you say I'm a good person, person's, I'm, I'm good, it, it, that's, there's nowhere in the Bible that says being good is the only person ever good enough to make heaven was Jesus. And all of us, the Bible says, have sinned at least once. And some of us, once an hour. Some of us more than that. So being good is not going to get you to heaven. And... There are many thoughts that we have, you know, maybe you grew up in the church or maybe you went to catechism classes or Sunday school classes or maybe you, you know, your parents put religious jewelry around. I used to have this cross around my neck and, you know, I used to think this thing has, you know, I was being a witness for God and, you know, it was somehow protective in my life and my mother used to always have a St. Christopher in the car and, you know, all of those things, as much as you, as you, uh, have participated in those things and have had those things in your life 
not one of them will get you to heaven. And the, you'd think that God, having sent his son Jesus, would tell mankind what it takes, what it takes for a person to make heaven. It's not just a, it's not something that's so complicated that we can never figure it out. And we have many ideas in our thoughts and our mind as to how we will make heaven, but there is only one way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. He is the only way that one can make heaven. And my question then becomes, okay, God, Jesus, if you're the only way to heaven, how do I enter through that door? How do I come through that gate? How do I find heaven through you? And this was the question that a very godly man in the scriptures asked Jesus. He came to Jesus by night because this man was a leader in the synagogue. He was a religious leader. He was somebody who knew the scriptures. He, he sang them. He knew them. He understood them. He quoted them. And he had one, one question for Jesus. He wanted to ask it in secret because he was scared of what other people might say. And he came to Jesus and said, Good teacher. He said, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? What must I do to get saved? What must I do to have an eternity of life after this death? And Jesus, you would have thought, would have said, oh, his name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you're an amazing guy. You, you know, you're a leader in the synagogue. You give alms. You, you help the poor. You, you memorize. You preach the Bible every week. Heavens just can't wait to have you. Jesus didn't say that to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, there's only one way. You must be born again. And that's a word that's been so sullied and destroyed by Hollywood and by other people who have criticized it and cut it down. But remember, the one who said you must be born again was not anybody in the media. It was Jesus Christ who said those words. And Nicodemus was confused like many people today. He's like, well, how do I do that? Do I go back in my mother's womb and get reborn? How does that happen? And then Jesus makes the statement. He says, I'm on my way, Nicodemus, to a cross. He says, I'm going to be lifted up from the earth. I'm going to hang between heaven and earth. And he says, all the sin of the world was going to be placed upon me. He says, for God loved this world so much, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He says, and when I'm hanging on that cross, he said, if you will put your faith and believe that I am the substitute for your sins and you will give all of your heart and all of your life to me and you will embrace a faith and you will give your life into my hands, you will be saved. And that's the same challenge that faces us today. Will we believe in Jesus Christ? Will we accept Him and fully give all of our heart and all of our life to Him? You've heard a wonderful message tonight and many of you have, have, I know, have gotten something from it. But it would be a shame if you were to leave tonight and that you had not become born again, that you had not for sure given your heart to Jesus Christ. You had not fully embraced what Jesus did for you on the cross. You see, He had to suffer. He had to go through that. He had a joy set before him, but he first of all had to pay for your sins. And the way that you are forgiven of your sins, when you put faith that he paid the price, you no longer have to pay the price. When you stand before God, God's going to say, you're guilty of these things. And you say, God, I know I'm guilty, but you know I put my faith that once upon a cross, your son paid the price, so I no longer have to pay them. And when you embrace a faith in Jesus, your sins are washed by His blood. And you stand clean before God. Not because you're any good, not because you're good enough, but because Jesus was good enough. And He gave His heart and His life for you and for the joy set before Him of seeing you accept and embrace a faith in Him. That's why He did it. That's why He loves you. And I want to give everybody here tonight a chance to accept Him as their Savior and their Lord. You may have never fully understood why Jesus died for you. You may have never fully understood what it meant to become a Christian. But tonight, God is speaking to you and He's calling you and saying, tonight's your night. Tonight's your night to give your heart to Jesus. Tonight's your night to be saved. I'm going to in a moment just count to three. And I'm going to pop my hands together like this and I'm going to say, 
at that moment when I pop my hands together, it gives you an opportunity. If tonight you want to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, when I pop my hands together like that, I want you just to raise up your hand, all of us together who want to give their lives to Jesus. And by the raising of your hand, you're saying, God, I don't just want Jesus in my head. I don't want just to know about Him. I don't just want to celebrate Christmas and Easter. Tonight, I want to embrace the faith in Jesus. I want to give Him all of my heart and all of my life. Tonight, I want to make sure that I'm born again. Who should raise their hands if you have been running from God instead of to Him? I'm speaking to you. If you're not sure that you've ever given your life to Him, I'm speaking to you. If you once maybe made a decision, but you've backslid and you're no longer, and you're not walking with God, but you want to come back to Him, I'm speaking to you. You should raise your hand. Any person who really wants to make that decision, it may be your first time that a friend brought you, and something in your heart saying, I need this Jesus. I know He loves me, and I know He cares. Tonight I want to make Him Lord. I'm speaking to you. So get ready all around across this auditorium. We're all going to do it together. And by the raising of your hand, Jesus said these words. He says, if you are willing to confess me before men, one day in heaven I will confess you before the Father. By raising up your hand, you're saying, Jesus, I'm not ashamed of you. I'm willing to confess you. I want you as my Lord and Savior. One day, when you stand before God in the, in the, in the throne room of heaven, Jesus is going to stand up and say, that person on that night raised their hand and they accepted me and they publicly gave their heart and their life to me and he'll stand before the Father and say that person's mine they confessed me before men and now I will confess them before the Father Jesus will confess you publicly before all the angels of heaven and before the Father if you're willing to confess him here so if you need to make that decision please don't wait till tomorrow don't put it off are you ready? one two Three, let me see your hands. If you need to make that decision, just raise your hand wherever you are. Just raise up your hands. I see a hand over here. Who else wants to raise their hand tonight? And you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. I need to probably put some glasses on here. Let's all stand in the presence of God. If you need to make that decision, just raise up your hand wherever you are. But I want you just to step out of your seat. I want you just to come down and meet me here in front. If you tonight need to make Jesus Lord of your life, I'd like to personally pray for you up front. And those of you who are watching online, I'm going to pray for you. Uh, we're all going to pray together and you're going to accept Jesus. So let's give them a hand. If you need to give Jesus all of your heart and all of your life, step into the aisle. Come down and meet me here up front. Just go ahead and step out. Come forward. Tonight's your night. Do not wait till tomorrow. Give Jesus your heart tonight. Come forward. Every moment I'm away. My heart's breaking. There are a number of people here tonight. And this may be your last chance that you ever have to accept Jesus. You've heard the word of the Lord tonight. Jesus loves you so much. Maybe some of you may feel shy. Tonight's your night to give your heart to Him. Please don't turn Him away. Don't reject Him. He loves you. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to change your heart. He wants to change your life. He wants to make everything new in your life. Let's just sing that one more time. If that you need to come, just step into the aisles. Please come tonight and give your heart to Jesus. Please don't put it off. If that's you, just step into the aisles and come down. Let's sing that one more time. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I'll live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment Come I'm forward. awake I'll bless you God loves Lord, you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you Respond to him tonight Lord, I give He you loves my you Anybody else that needs to make that decision? Jesus paid a horrible price for our salvation. He 
died a horrible death to save our souls. And all it takes is for you to accept Him, turn your life away from evil, and turn it to Him, and give your heart and soul to Him. I'm going to sing it one more time. I believe there's just still one or two others that need to come. Come forward. Go ahead. Because, Lord, I give you my heart. Please come forward. I give you my soul. And I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Every moment I'm awake. God bless you. Let's give him a hand. Lord, have your way. It takes courage to serve God. It takes courage to serve Him. It's worth it. We're going to pray. God bless you for taking the step of courage and faith. The life will never be the same again. One day Jesus is going to stand before the throne of heaven. He's going to confess you. There's some people that maybe didn't have enough courage to come forward. I want you still to pray this prayer. And then I want you to go to the back after we're done here. We're going to pray together, and I want you to pray this from your heart. And everybody here, pray in agreement. And pray with those who are praying this online. Let's say these words to Jesus. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. You came to this earth. You were born as a child. You grew up to be a man. You went to a cross. You died a horrible death for my sins for my salvation I believe you rose from the dead and you're alive right now and you're here in this place I ask you Jesus forgive my past I turn away from darkness and I turn to you I ask you to wash away my past forgive it with your blood and come into my heart be the Lord of my life be my Savior and help me from this day forward to serve you all the days of my life I thank you that I am now saved that I am now a believer I am now a Christian and you are now my Lord and my Savior in Jesus name Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I want you just to turn to your left, my right here. And this is Pastor Dave. He's just going to take a moment with you. We have just a few little booklets to give you that the senior pastors have written that will help you know what to do next. And he'll offer you also a SPT we have at this church, which is a spiritual personal trainer. For five weeks, somebody who'll meet with you but right before church and just give you some help. We'll be pray for you and be able to just take you through some guiding steps in your, as you start your walk with God. So if you can take a left turn, follow Pastor David. Let's give them a hand as they go.